In the Federal Tort Claims Act, Congress allowed the United States to be sued for tort damages under some very limited circumstances. As we will see in this presentation on the procedures and provisions of the Act, if this is an administrative compensation system and it has to be complied with fairly exactly to get compensation. In the next presentation, we'll discuss the discretionary function exception, which makes it quite difficult to sue the government for any decisions that are related to government policy making. The Federal Tort Claims Act was passed at the 1945 at the end of World War II. This was the same period when the Administrative Procedure Act was passed. Up until then, all payments for tort damages were paid through private bills sponsored by individual legislators and passed through Congress and signed by the President. There was no judicial review or administrative review of the claims which left the determination of their validity to the individual congresspersons. This took a lot of congressional time. It was also a fertile ground for graft and corruption. The Federal Tort Claims Act sets up an administrative compensation system and the decisions of this administrative compensation compensation system are then appealable to the federal district court. The claims are adjudicated by the head of the federal agency that was responsible for the action that led to the damages. The language is a general grant of authority to the agency to evaluate the claims, settle them, adjust them in different ways, um, and these include claims for injury or loss of property or person or death caused by negligent or wrongful omission of an, any employee of the agency. It's a fairly standard statement of tort liability. The problem is that there isn't a systematic body of federal tort law. So the Congress looked to the state where the actual accident occurred and a claimant under the under the Federal Tort Claims Act will look to the state tort and state a claim based on the state tort principles and the recovery is allowed under circumstances where the United States if a private person would be liable to the claimant in accordance with the law of the place where the act of omission occurred. This also includes state tort reform limits. So in states that have adopted medical review panels or damages caps in various tort cases, those also apply to federal tort claim actions. The statement that the United, where the United States, if a private person would be liable to the claimant, misleads many attorneys. As we'll find in the next presentation, the standards for proof in the Tort Claims Act are profoundly different when it concerns government policy actions. One of the primary purposes of the Federal Tort Claims Act is to protect federal employees from personal liability. Congress does not want federal employees making decisions based on their fear of being sued. They want policy decisions to be made in compliance with executive direction and statute of regulations. Under the Act, if you sue an individual, the government is substituted for the individual. This, of course, only applies if the individual is acting within the course and scope of the employment so if they are outside course and scope, then you'd be dealing with an ordinary tort case and it would not be triggered by trigger the FTCA. There are significant limitations on liability in the Federal Tort Claims Act as compared to state tort law. One critical dimension is there's no liability for interest prior to judgment and there's no liability for punitive damages. 
you read the statute, there's some special provisions for damages and death cases, but that's a more of historic interest. When the statute was passed, certain states had significant limitations on damages in death cases, and the Act wanted to provide some recovery in those cases. There's no strict liability, products liability claims under the Federal Tort Claims Act, nor is there any special treatment of claims for ultra-hazardous activities. And the original version of the Act did not allow recovery for intentional torts. There are numerous other specific exemptions in the Act. For example, claims for damages caused by imposition or establishment of a quarantine. Uh, claims arising out of the combated activities of the na military naval forces of the Coast Guard during times of war. Any claim arising in a foreign country. So the Federal Tort Claims Act cannot be used for foreign nationals suing over U.S. actions outside of the United States. There are also several specific agency exemptions such as for actions of the Tennessee Value Authority. If we remember that statutes and derogation of immunity are construed narrowly, then the creating an exempt exemption in the Federal Tort Claims Act means that there is no liability against the government for the exempted activity. If the exempted activity might otherwise be fall under the jurisdiction of the Court of Federal Claims, like a takings, there could be liability under the provisions for the Court of Federal Claims. But generally, if you fall outside of the Federal Tort Claims Act, there is no liability. After the Federal Tort Claims Act was passed and it became common for individuals to be able to recover from the federal government for tort damages, Cases were brought to the United States Supreme Court against law enforcement officers for intentional torts, which were accepted under the Federal Tort Claims Act, and thus there could be no recovery for them. In this particular case, we have federal agents breaking into a plaintiff's home and handcuffing him in front of his family without a warrant. The posture of the case is really as an alternative remedy case, and you may have discussed it in ACJ. The court recognized that the exclusionary rule, which is the usual remedy for warrantless searches, is useless to an innocent man. The only value of the exclusionary rule is that it keeps criminal evidence of criminal from behavior from being introduced into a trial if it was obtained by an illegal search. But if there's an innocent man and no evidence of behavior and no criminal trial, then there's no redress. To solve this problem, the court created a constitutional tort remedy that in torts that sound at a constitutional level, which these would include, in this particular case, invasion of privacy, damages could be obtained from the federal government. So this created a direct act action against the individual employees for violation of constitutional rights. This is outside the Federal Tort Claims Act. Unlike the Federal Tort Claims Act, this is an action directly against the individuals, not against the government. There's no vicarious liability. If you want to hold a supervisor of an individual liable, you have to show that the supervisor was also involved in the tort. This created a flood of claims. It led Congress to amend the Federal Tort Claims Act to include coverage for intentional torts by law enforcement officers. So for admission, acts or omissions of investigative or law enforcement officers, they could, you can sue them under the Federal Tort Claims Act for assault, battery, 
false imprisonment, false arrest, abusive process, or malicious prosecution. It's a fairly broad definition of who an investigative or law enforcement officer is. The court has ruled that if the federal torts claim is available, it is the exclusive remedy. So for intentional torts by law enforcement personnel that fall under the new Section 2680H, there is no longer a Bivens remedy available. There are still Bivens remedies available for non-law enforcement employees who, thus, who are not covered by the Federal Tort Claims Act. For example, medical personnel in a detention center were found liable under Bivens for conscious indifference to a prisoner's medical needs. Research has shown that while the Bivens action is a personal action for intentional torts, and the court expected that the individuals, not the government, would pay the claims, that the government in almost all cases does pay for the damages and Bivens claims and also reimburse the employees for their legal defense costs. This is because the, the Bivens claims generally arise within the course and scope of employment and as with the employees cover a Federal Tort Claims Act, the government agencies are concerned that their employees not make decisions based on fear of personally having to pay liability claims. The United States Supreme Court has recently said that it will not expand Bivens to any new areas. The majority has argued that Congress can expand the Federal Tort Claims Act if it chooses to, and Congress's inaction in expanding the Federal Tort Claims Act in new areas represents a congressional policy that there shouldn't be compensation in these areas. This has been particularly troublesome in recent cases involving issues such as cross-border shootings uh, and the unavailability of the Bivens remedy. It's likely that Bivens is going to be kept with existing precedent unless there's a major shift in the United States Supreme Court's views of Bivens or the personnel of the court. There's a specific procedure for filing a Federal Tort Claims Act claim. The best way to file a claim to make sure you're within the procedure is to use the officially promulgated Form 95. Form 95 is available in your material so you can review an actual form. It looks like an insurance claims form. Uh, we'll go through the specific things that have to be provided, but it's a pretty straightforward, simple form. Uh, interestingly, it also includes information about insurance covered, coverage for the incident for which a tort claim is being uh, made. Uh, the government is will get subrogated to the insurance if and the tort claim will be reduced if there's been an insurance payment. Properly filed claim has to include these items and this is specified on form 95. A claim will be deemed to be properly presented when a federal agency receives from a claimant his duly authorized agent or legal representative, an executed standard Form 95, or other written and indicate notice of an incident. Now this is important because you don't have to use a Form 95, and this has come up in some cases where plaintiffs made, for, made claims that weren't on Form 95. The court looked to determine whether they contained the core information, and if they did, the form was not necessary. Now, in addition to the specific information about the accident, there needs to be a claim for money damages in a sum certain, and the claim needs to be presented within two years after the claim accrues, which would normally be two years after the accident. 
key difference between a Federal Tort Claims Act claim and a complaint in federal court. Lawyers sometimes confuse these two. Very first, we know that this is a record review adjudication. It's not a hearing. Records will be presented to the agency. They may ask for additional information. They might do discovery and conduct depositions, but ultimately this is a paper-based process like a social security disability hearing, or social security disability review. Key to this is the claimant has to provide enough info on the facts of the case to allow the agency to investigate the claim. If the claim ends up being based on different facts when it goes to court, then the notice under the act will fail. The only claim that the court will consider is that that's based on the specific facts in the notice to the agency because otherwise the agency will not have had time to investigate the basis of the, of the claim that will be litigated in court. So the statute of limitations runs on facts that are not relied on in the claim to the agency. And unlike a complaint in federal court where you can make a general damages claim as long as you say that you're in excess of the jurisdiction, the Federal Tort Claims Act claim needs to include a specific amount of damages. Some lawyers go directly to court without going through the presentation of the claim to the agency. The statute's very clear that you cannot go to court until you've instituted the claim. Uh, this is actually necessary for jurisdiction, and since this is a statute in derogation of immunity, the courts read this very narrowly. Uh, while you don't have to use the Form 95, you do have to file the information with the agency within the two-year time frame and give the agency a chance to respond before you can go to court. Later on in the course, we'll discuss the general problem of what's termed exhaustion of remedies. The exhaustion of remedies doctrine requires you to complete all agency actions before you go to court. So the Federal Tort Claims requirement of the claim being filed is really part of the exhaustion of remedies problem. If you go to court without having exhausted the remedy or without having provided the correct facts in your claim, the court will dis dismiss your claim and there's very little room for equitable remedies by the court since without satisfying the details of the statute, you don't have jurisdiction to be in the court at all. In many cases, the agency never responds to the claim. Uh, this was true in the Katrina litigation where Tens of thousands of poorly formed claims were filed with the agency and the agency did not reply to many of them. Uh, the statute provides that if you don't hear from the agency within six months after you file the claim, then the claimant at their option can go to uh, court at any time thereafter. So that once you, you file your claim within the two years, the agency will either grant your claim or deny your claim. At that point, you can go to court. If you haven't heard from the agency within six months of filing the claim, then you're deemed to have complied with the statute and you can go to court. It's important to realize that while the action in the federal court looks like a normal tort action, it's really technically litigating the denial of the claim by the agency. You'll have to plead the compliance with the statute as part of your statement of jurisdiction. That'll be the facts about the claim that you presented to the agency within the time frame and that either the agency had responded in an unsatisfactory way 
or that the agency had not responded and six months had elapsed since you filed the claim. Beyond that, it looks like a general torts action. One procedural point is that while you can have multi-party Federal Tort Claims Act litigation, at least in theory, you can't have class actions because these are each individual appeals. In practice, there's not a clear precedent on this. While many tort, mass tort claim act claims were filed as class actions, they were all ultimately dismissed. So the court never really had to have a clear ruling on whether they could have been filed as class actions. So to think about you know, what you should have learned about Federal Tort Claims Act, do you understand the difference in a Tort Claims Act claim and a Bivens claim as to who you're suing? Uh, how does the Federal Tort Claims Act differ from a complaint in federal, in dis federal district court? Know the procedure uh, for filing a claim and how to satisfy the statutory requirements and then when you can actually go to court.